Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Candace Jimenez, and I am from the Confederated Tribes of Warm Springs and serve in maternal child health programming here at the Health Board. Thank you for joining us today as we continue the Maternal Child Health Echo Series. This is the second session of a six-part series, and today's topic will cover breastfeeding during the coronavirus or COVID-19. Before we get started, I want to introduce you to our lead faculty. Dr. Allison Empey is a member of the Confederated Tribes of Grand Round. She is a pediatrician and deputy director of the Northwest Native American Center of Excellence at Oregon Health and Science University. Joining Dr. Empey is Don Bankson, a pediatric nurse practitioner. She has worked in public and migrant health and within tribal clinics, including the Kunal Indian Nation, as their pediatric provider for the past nine years. She recently joined the Health Board via a grant with the CDC Foundation. Finally, we want to welcome our didactic presenter today, Ms. Roberta Eaglehorse Ortiz. Roberta is Ogala Lakota and Yoba Shoshone. Roberta has worked in maternal child health for over 20 years as a community health worker, full circle doula, lactation educator, and breastfeeding peer counselor. She is the founder and executive director of the Oregon Intertribal Breastfeeding Coalition from 2013 to 2020. Her focus is on infant feeding, human milk for human babies, and first foods is her passion. She serves community with an understanding of support to families in navigating medical systems and to get them off to a good start. Welcome, Roberta. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. I've been um, interested in seeing how um, COVID is being, you know, responded to in Indian country surrounding maternal child health. And so it was very exciting to see that this is um, a case um, that had been presented, you know, in the situation and to be asked to come on here. Um, looking over that uh, case study was, was um, interesting to see, like I brought up, we have a lot of information that has been missing in this in this uh, case study and longevity of the separation um, you know how was the connection with mom and baby the resources that are out there um, i personally know um, in oregon in our pacific northwest and across the nation how much support that there is for these specific situations and um, in the mainstream medical um, establishments they're not seem to be utilized, um, which, is a, which is a safety net for our families. Um, but connection to those extensive resources have not reached Indian country. So that's one of the things that I was excited to bring here and uh, we'll get through to some of those. But some of the very basic information that's here to really support exactly that dyad, that family unit. Um, when we're looking at traditional, you know, being, being indigenous and traditional, it's like this happens to a whole family, you know, a whole community, you know, this child has been, you know, um, brought in in an, un, you know, unexpected way. And so when we're looking at, you know, newborns, you know, how they get their milk, that was my first question is, you know, separation of mom and baby, medical transport, you know, physicians have a lot of power to write on a script to say, we need medical transport for this milk. You know, how dire was this baby? What were the other conditions of this child? You know, the stressors of the mom um, being connected with that is, um, is, is already in a pandemic state. So that's not even adding the complications of COVID-19. So to be home and have COVID-19 and not sure what those situations are is really hard. Um, so I wanted to also include so more of a well-rounded, you know, question about, yes, how was mom doing? you know, how was her nutrition? So it was good that she had access to WIC and, and that we have these resources for, thank you, for WIC. And, um, you know, we want to support people, you know, in their family units and nutrition is key. Like we're thinking about the pandemic and where we're at today. So we already know the, um, the social stressors that are out there of unemployment, access to resources, housing instability, like me as a provider, I think of those because I'm more of a community health worker or traditional health worker um, mentality and a community, you know, driven oriented. Um, it, that's what it is in this profession. So looking at that and and 
you know, so when she's already in labor, what's happening, already acknowledging protective measures that did not get to happen while she had a cesarean section. So I've just made sure I was here in my office to kind of like show what's in the back here is a mother that is having a vaginal birth. So it starts from, you know, in utero, nutrition protection already in a pandemic. What are those stressors, you know, during labor already having a cesarean section, premature baby, separated from baby, baby did not get mother's um, vaginal juices, like inoculated into the, you know, into her body. What are those, what are those issues and how does that, you know, move through the baby and recovery? Well, we've been through a ton of cesarean sections. We know that we can, you know, the medical system is prepared to help through those. But I'm here to talk about, you know, Native families having access and understanding, you know, later on down the road, what happens. So again, I just had, you know, vaginal birth here, did not get to happen, nutrition, stress factors, you know, all of these um, things that are going on, newborn baby, she's already, you know, missing this situation. Um, so yeah, what was I going with this? Um, I had it. Just let here. me know when you want next slide. Yes, please. Next slide. And that is, yes. So we're looking at breast milk and why this is so important, why we're talking about breast milk. And if people know that breast milk is a live, um, live food source and look at all the ingredients in breast milk. So that's naturally, you know, grown by mom, provided to baby, um, has so many wonderful things that, you know, um, everything from colostrum is the very minute amounts of milk that are jam packed and they're like a, um, superfood. So infants are born with tiny tummies and mom gets the milk tailored to her baby immediately. And so pasteurized food is really great. It, it will sustain a life. It will give nutrients that are packed in there so we can put minerals and, you know, um, nutrients in formula, um, but is not a live food source. And um, in WIC, they give a certain amount. WIC is actually not um, giving a full month supply. I think that people forget that that's a supplemental program. And so babies could be eating more than that in their, you know, in their um, dietary time. So I'm not sure if that's per day, per week, and how people are, you know, factoring that into to how we're providing food for our children. So I always want to go back to food sovereignty and being a native person and having a bunch of health disparities and how do we really reclaim our bodies and having confidence in our bodies that we can prov provide food, nutrients and love and care and bonding for our children. Um, there's so many things that get in between us and our children and our bodies and breastfeeding is one of those things and having support systems for breastfeeding and continuing that is super important. Um, this is a traditional first food of all humans. And I think that with this new food sovereignty movement, it's only been the last three years or so that people have recognized that breastfeeding and human milk for human babies were a part of food sovereignty and were a part of um, reclaiming, you know, traditional foods. And so, um, so there's many people talking about human milk for human babies, um, because as, as the doctor had said earlier, um, we want to be respectful to all people. Not everybody want, claims breast as breastfeeding, it's chest feeding, however they want to identify and making sure that we're available and open for all people to understand that human milk for human babies is the most important. Um, it's ready to eat, you know, serving size. Um, the breast milk is alive and so it releases those um, triggers for babies to know when they're full. So babies are not going to overeat, they're going to eat to sustain and it's so pure and perfect that it digests right into the body as it needs to very low waste um, you can tell by the poop you know that um, breast milk fed babies and formula fed babies they smell different the, the consistency is different um, a lot of the attitudes between babies are different and um, of course the bonding and holding so there's more bottle propping and disconnection from babies eating um, when they're in a with bottle than they are when they're with breast because mom has the baby or with a bottle, you know, I just want to stress to folks 
that, you know, in a pandemic state, it's really hard for folks to be attentive sometimes to their children. And so bottle feeding is one of the, I mean, bottle propping is one of those things that we always need to keep in the forefront of our minds um, to, to suggest that, you know, we need to not do that. Um, we can go to the next slide. All right, so we have a few benefits to breast milk here for mom and baby. Um, I wanted to put it out there in the chat um, for people to put out more benefits that you can think of and know about um, for the benefits for mom and baby and breast milk and breastfeeding. Now just give a couple seconds for that. Do you have anything pop up? Yes, we do have calorie burning, allergy risk. Absolutely, absolutely. So when we're talking about breast milk, uh huh, and it's free, we love that. Um, yes, very cost effective, ready to eat. Like I said, perfect temperature, availability, on the go. Um, so many wonderful things that can be supported um, uh, for the mom and baby. Lifetime, you know, bonding. It's really great. Um, Yes, they are really great. Um, so I wanted to, I forgot to go back and talk about um, the, the gut. So, you know, the colostrum does um, protect from the mouth through to the intestines digestive system. Um, that's really important for like leaky gut. You know, it helps prevent um, all these pathogens and free radicals and stuff to start you know, um, absorbing into the body, you know, we're able to, if we are protected in our digestive system, we're able to be protected and breastfeeding and breast milk does do that. Um, so we have healthier babies, lower um, allergens, uh, you know, for, for kids um, and just exposure to, to, to those good benefits. Anything else? Yes, creates positive bonding. We can go to the next slide. Love talking about lactation. Um, so a lot of the um, stress factors that come with the idea to breastfeed, you know, it's interesting to say that there's a question now, do you plan to breastfeed? You know, if we have long history of breastfeeding being taken from just people in general, and then we can get down to race and economic, you know, experience. Um, and again, I'll talk about resources in a little bit, but I wanted to show this lactating breast on this side because a lot of people are not even comfortable or understand how this works. So I wanted to get into biofeedback. And so biofeedback between a mom and a baby dyad is super important. And so when we're looking at premature babies or just, you know, kids in general, it's so important to have that. Um, support with latch and then the um, biodynamic feedback that's a protective measure. So let's say mom is going out to the store, you know, early postpartum have got to get their supplies. They don't have people to shop for them. So take baby going out there. Hopefully they've nursed before they went to the store. Um, and then you go out into the community and you are breathing in all sorts of things like this i'm talking before you know covid times but definitely now in covid times we're very much more um i think in tune to how much we're touching how much exposure and how slack we've been throughout the these times you know um so i can say that's a good thing um but so baby's exposed mom's exposed to many different things just regular things um, and then they leave and mom goes to nurse again. Well, what baby has been exposed to can transfer between the saliva and as the baby nurses opens the milk ducts that goes into the breast, mom's, you know, antibody, you know, generator factor, you know, factory starts making those to be tailored to the baby. Now, in our references, we tried to um, put in some, some articles and some studies and different things in there to kind of get you looking in the right direction or, you know, extending your education in these, in these areas is really important. But I wanted to show, you know, this breast and how it does work. And explaining this to moms is very important. So if they are separated from their children, they can understand how to hand express, you know, like, you know, not everybody can receive a pump 
not everybody can has you know electricity we have to think about these things in a pandemic because in sanitary so washing hands washing breasts you know covering up when we're nursing um, or even feeding babies like all of these things is a life change for all of us and the more that we can be more in tune with you know living in a pandemic state the more that we'll be able to like really shoot off this information now in native communities, many of us have lived in pandemic states like our whole lives, you know, whether we have access to water, resources, housing, jobs, you know, family connections. And just because we're saying in Indian country does not mean that everybody has those concrete connections to community. There's very, uh, there's a lot of people that still don't have connections to, you know, source and community and, you know, culture. So I would don't wanna put that on folks um, here. So nipples um, uh, that we're looking at here, correct latch, people are understanding. Many people I talk to don't understand what latch is and will only get the nipple. So having these diagrams and really showing the, oh, I had my breast here, but showing how that latch works and how much that nipple has to go down the baby's neck really make moms want to work with that. You know, it makes it feel like, okay, I wasn't getting it right. All of those are, you know, success, you know, um, indicators for mom of being like, I'm not doing it enough. How do you break away? How do you restart again? You know, and if they're feeling like they're unable to take care of their baby, they're unable to feed their child, just imagine how that's working for their milk production. Um, it's not, you know, so as many things that we can save moms from, you know, from stressing out would be best. You can go to the next slide, please. Wanted to get back to the size of the newborn stomach here. So we're talking about a premature baby. And we're also wanting to, I'm wanting to acknowledge that in hospitals, I'm sure a lot more people are more aware of, you know, how much to feed babies. But personal experience, I've seen half ounce, ounce for brand new babies. And that's a really a lot of, a lot of food to have for a brand new child. So if you can imagine what we feel like as adults when we indulge and we overeat, what happens? We get really full, tired, lethargic, uncomfortable. Um, so if you can imagine a newborn that's never had that issue because they, you know, been sustained through the umbilicus from the umbilical cord in, in pregnancy, this is all new to them. And so, like I said, live food, babies usually do not breastfeed and over engorge themselves. They'll eat to when they're full and that's why they're, they wake up more frequently. So they wake up every couple hours and in the, new, in the newborn stage, they wake up even more because they're wanting to learn, they're wanting to be connected with mom. All of these things that are keeping this dyad together is so important. Like we're so in tune physiologically, emotionally, spiritually connected to our children. And so understanding and letting mom know those cues working against, you know, plastic, plastic, plastic. So they get pacifiers, you know, all of these things, which moms need those cues to learn in the safety of the hospital while they're there for, you know, a couple days, you know, um, we have a lot of home birth. I'm a home birth mom. Um, I've had two hospital births, but my rest of my children were all three and my last three were home births. So there's many different ideas and experiences that we all carry, um, many different communities that we all carry. Um, and, and we should be sharing those. So um, if you see this up to one month is an egg, you know, which is possibly, you know, it's, it's not a lot, but the more that we feed, the more that we understand, the more that we break away those things that get in, impede us from our babies and understanding what those cues are, you know, and, and what is a, what is a attention cue versus a hunger cue versus a wet cue versus a distress cue. Um, there's so many different things. Um, so yeah, just thinking about feeding. Hopefully I'm not talking too fast. It's, it's a different, different way of being with you all. Okay, so yes, we're getting to the precautionary recommendations for COVID-19. So wrapping this stuff together, um, you know, even though it's uncomfortable, you know, wearing a mask or if your baby will allow you to cover up, that, that's a good measure, good measure to have. Um, when you're in community, um, social distancing and precautions, you know, like 
not everybody gets to hold and kiss and feed, you know, baby, you know, you want to have helpers, but really lowering that contact contact rate between infant and outside folks um, is really important. Always staying home when you have your symptoms. Um, so it's really important to, you know, be truthful about how you feel. A lot of people just kind of think this can't be me. It can't be happening. You know, um, there's other things that are going around aside of COVID-19. So hopefully living in this pandemic, we're just more hyper aware of the different ways and how we're feeling and our exposure, cleaning our homes, everything down to where we've touched, you know, handles, every little thing that you use on a regular basis. As a provider and a doula, I would be going into people's homes uh, and when they want to nest and I would wash from as high as I could reach all the way down from all the way around the perimeter of the house. So it's worrying about how, what kind of cleaning, you know, products that you use because we're also thinking about um, gases, you know, everything has a smell, you know, um, we're in this SARS, you know, situation and everyone was using so many chemicals. I had complaints of people having headaches, feeling really sick, you know, knowing that we can dilute safe practices in sanitation is, is one of the top for me that I want to share with folks is that we want to just make sure that we aren't, you know, suffering on always trying to do the right thing. Um, so yes, uh, workstations right on a regular basis, you know, keyboards, everything, um, staying updated on your immunizations and your prenatal postpartum visits, you know, really making connections with people and keeping in contact, you know, with all of your providers is important. Um, yes, and covering while you, yeah, is, is wearing your mask. I think we did that twice. Um, pumping, for the pumping and bottling, bottle feeding families, please, please, please wash your hands and sanitize your gear before and after. Just because you know if it's sitting there, we don't know it's airborne. Um, make sure that you have it maybe in a container, if you can put it in a bin, something that's not out there that can have droplets onto them would be better. Um, yes, just trying to keep that contained. Next slide, Cam. I've included some breastfeeding resources for COVID-19. Um, so we're, um, it was just everything that we could, could think of. We have a lot of people on here that are lay folks, family community members, providers, doctors, physicians, nurses, um, you know, uh, everyone that is out there. So you'll be able to see one of the things that was missing in all of this is a workforce. Um, so they did say that I was a lactation educator, um, breastfeeding peer counselor, a full circle doula, traditional healthcare worker, and a community healthcare worker. So I've been really privileged to like have the job um, and take control of my career to be able to navigate through all of these systems and be welcomed into hospitals during birth, be welcomed into the NICUs, to be that support person when moms and babies are separated. I'm usually the one that gets another bracelet aside of the partner pre-COVID times. And so I would go from, you know, operating room, recovery room, follow baby over to NICU, make connections with the nurses there, knowing that I will be the one running back and forth so mom can heal, you know, um, dad can visit, like just being that support person has really opened up my scope and, um, and humility to what the system is and how people don't exactly get what they need into these systems because there's so many people back to back to back to back. Everyone's different, every situation is different. Um, and to have supportive um, people there as community health workers or traditional birth workers, which are birth doulas, um, we do get reimbursed by Medicaid um, and we can be a support system for you know the in-hospital setting. Um, breastfeeding care counselors are important and there are people that have breastfed for at least six months. And the, we have a phone line that I've attached on there that people just don't know that they can just call somebody with their breastfeeding questions um, and have those answered. Um, as I work as a doula privately, um, I was doing at least six weeks postpartum care just to make sure that breastfeeding was off to a, an excellent start and I can connect people to resources as fast as possible. So working with a lot of these folks on here with connecting with pumps, 
you know, um, we all know that, you know, many resources um, or organizations are really slammed. And so we do our best. I continue to do my best on trying to help families get their breast pumps to them, get extra bottles, you know, how to access resources, clothes, you know, this is that community um, health worker sort of uh, framework that I get to work in. And it's been really wonderful to also have my connections to um, our, our, our race and ethnicity and culture has been a grounding uh, and focusing um, place to be in community because I've seen so many wonderful things that are going on. Uh, this resurgence in um, taking control of our bodies and autonomy and food sovereignty. So this is a grander conversation um, and just touching on breastfeeding and COVID-19 is just a blip of what we can talk about as far as breastfeeding um, and human milk for human babies. Um, so yes, you'll get this in an email. Um, if you can go, it's a survey also. When I had Oregon Intertribal Breastfeeding Coalition, um, we did a, a two surveys and it was to get the wide range information about what breastfeeding support looks like for in Indian country. And so I would do powwows, clinics, you know, send the link out to, you know, providers um, so they could, you know, we could get our own information to know how to serve community on our scale. Um, the coalition and the work got so large and, um, you know, traveled across the nation, you know, in different communities. It was such a beautiful thing. And I realized that I had this for seven years and we did a lot of work and it really needed to be absorbed and pushed out into native communities. Um, and so we've offered this survey so you can take it back and look over it and see if you need to tailor it to your communities that you serve. Um, you're open to do that. Um, we did have a tribe that has in the Pacific Northwest that has um, done that very same thing. And so now they have specific tribal sort of a map of what they can do to make, increase their breastfeeding support. And so, yeah, so that's there in the resources and you can go to the last. So that picture was of a mom and a toddler nursing, and we always want to show and normalize the longevity of nursing. So as long as it's good for mom and baby and family, and it's working for both to continue to nurse, that's that's how it should happen. Um, women always have to, you know, combat, you know, other family members or community members about how long they breastfeed, and um, you know, up until four or five years old, you know, however it's comfortable they're able to do that. But um, the CDC and everyone else is recommending at least six months of uninterrupted um, sole breastfeeding, you know, to really get that baby under um, on a good standing like health wise. And here is my contact information. I've moved to uh, the women's wellness garden. So understanding that food and nutrition is a huge part um, of our of our, our work. And so as you have birth work, it's interesting to have, you know, all of this uh, information about the power of the pyramid. Okay, so yes, so food sources, traditional foods, there's teas, all sorts of good things. Please ask questions. I would love to answer those. Roberta, there's a, there are a couple questions in the chat. First, can you please mention opportunities? Um, can, I, can you please mention opportunities to get people um, trained and involved in this work? Absolutely, absolutely. So those are also included in the resources. So we have everything from peers to lactation consultants, lactation educators, uh, support systems, um, international lactation uh, consultant group, uh, all sorts of things. We also added um, some indigenous women who are doing postpartum um, nutrition programs, doula trainings in there. Uh, Melissa Brown, she's from uh, Canada up there, you know, really important stuff there. So, you know, it's just getting in there and finding out what it looks like, being brave to show up to these, um, these meetings, Zoom calls. This has been a majority of white community leading the way as far as this profession. And it really is open to us 
to really, this should be basic knowledge for all people to understand how to support. Um, so yes, yeah, so there's a lot of things here. Um, Portland State University also has a lactation educator program and I was on the board to help them recruit folks for that. Um, we really need more um, access to these services. I was not going to become a lactation consultant because it was not um, accessible to my community. I'm a, I'm a direct services person. And so I felt like I would not be able to serve native women, you know, on the regular. Um, so that was uh, a choice that I made, but education is the key, uh, community engagement, um, classes, nutritional opportunities for folks, um, gatherings, you know, I really see that grassroots work can happen and also partnering with health boards and hospitals, uh, NICUs, you know, different, different folks to share learning is really important. Yes, workplace policies, returning to work, all of that information, you know, we've touched on a little bit of everything in that resource list. And if you email back, um, if there's something that's missing, or you can contact any of those other um, organizations on there for more, but every like websites, um, case studies, you know, reports, um, everything that I can just think of in a short amount of time. We just wanted to make sure that an hour is not a lot to talk about this. So yeah, I was like, I could do about three hours, but you know, it's all right. Roberta, we have another question asking what traditional foods and medicines you would recommend for breastfeeding? Traditional foods. Oh, I am so glad. Thank you. I was rushing so much. So I did want to talk about fetal alcohol spectrum disorder and alcohol exposed during pregnancy. Um, hops, the actual plant that, you know, beer is made out of is the actual key ingredient as a galactagogue. A galactagogue is what increases breast milk. So it's the hops that's the magic, not the alcohol and the beer. And so you can drink hops and that still relax, you know, helps you relax, helps increase breast volume, the milk volume production. It's really awesome. It's bitter. Um, I always recommend raspberry leaf to go with that. It's good with, with antioxidants. Um, it helps the womb tone as well. So we're not just talking about just breast and, and all of this, but the whole woman care and something, things that are not going to be, you know, detrimental to the baby. Um, milky oats is a wonderful thing. Um, we have it in our resources as well about galactagogues. Definitely something to get into. Um, sharing about store accessible milk, breast milk tea. So milk made tea, um, mother's milk tea. So we have pregnancy teas, breastfeeding teas. I also sell teas in the women's wellness garden. That's kind of just been the whole direction is to help. Um, there's mother wart that helps with, you know, hormone imbalances, you know, so like, you know, um, postpartum depression or restlessness. There's so many things that can help. And sometimes it's just chamomile that you need to relax and, and take it all in and have that moment to put your feet up and really focus on where we are right now. Have I eaten? Have I drank water? Like what's my intake? We need to pause. So that is helping families understand that we work and live in a frantic state and pausing and learning to pause and have a regimen of pause is really important to um, increase breast milk. Thank you so much, Roberta. This was a beautiful presentation and I think all of us learned quite a bit today. Um, so I'll just reiterate that we will have a, an email and also up on the Indian Country Echo site, all of the resources and the resource list that Roberta has been, been referring to, to will also be on that website. Um, so we'll be sure to get that out to you. Um, as well, I just wanted to remind everyone that there is a evaluation survey link that uh, is in the chat. We will also include that um, in the email in case uh, you're not able to click on that or complete that at this time. Um, please watch for that in our email as well. Um, so I just wanna thank you again, gratitude Roberta uh, to our faculty here today, Dr. Empey and Dawn as well, gratitude to our MCH work group and ECHO team here at the health board. So thank you all for, for being here today and uh, we wish you well and good health and safety out there.